Thank you, music musicians. Beautiful. Good morning, Triune. We would like to welcome everyone to worship with us both in person and online this morning. We are so glad that you are here. We do ask that everyone will please um, silence their cell phones right now. And please just remember to wear your mask through the whole service also. Um, we just have a couple of announcements this morning. Um, first of all, I'd like to welcome our guest speaker, Tony McDade. Um, some of y'all might know him from his um, time as director at United Ministries. Um, I know him as my father. So welcome, welcome Dad. Um, we also invite everybody to join us on Wednesday for our prayer meeting as well at, noon, at uh, 12 o'clock noon. Thank you. Good morning, church. I'd like for you to join with me in the response for the reading coming from Psalms 23. If you read along with me. Come walk in green pastures. Come lie down in green pastures. Come dine at the table of abundancy. Come do well in God's house. Uh, I'd just like to say we had a Bible study here some time back, and it was uh, entitled Our Purpose on Earth. And it was uh, conducted by Mr. Toby, I believe, and it was one of Rick Warren's books. It said, Our Purpose on Earth was to serve God and love Him. And let us work for God, our shepherd, because that's all he asks us to do, you know. Thank you. Forever. 
Please join me in unison for our prayer of confession. You invite us to your feast, O oh God, and we do not come. You beg us to give thanks for life, and we fail in our thanksgiving. You have made for us a wonderful earth, and we neglect the gift. Forgive us for what we have done and for abandoning the pathway you desire for us. Be our guide and conscious, turn our feet and hands to your will, that all we do might give glory to you. In Christ's name we pray, amen. The God of peace, who calls on all creation to live in unity, hears your plea in the spirit of feasting and thanksgiving. In the mercy of Almighty God and through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ our Savior, you are forgiven. Hallelujah and amen. Please join me for a moment of silence and our prayer of the people. Gracious and loving God, God, you have given us another day of completely gracious life. Your blessings are endless. Our fellowship and our community, your creation and your eternal love and guidance. Yet as people, we tend to focus on more on what we don't have than on the many gifts that you have given us. As a society, we fail to show gratitude for all of our children regardless of race, sexual orientation, economic status. Let us be grateful, Lord, for our leaders who stand up for social justice and condemn the words of leaders who speak against it. Lord, let us not focus on what we think we deserve, but instead be grateful for what we have. Let us not focus on what we want, but instead let us focus on what and how we can give. Let us not say, this is not enough, but instead say, this is more than enough. Lord, we thank you for your gift of gratitude. We thank you for teaching us how to be grateful. And we thank you for teaching us how nostalgia, worry, greed, disappointment, and entitlement keep us from being truly grateful. We ask that you center our hearts and minds as we seek to be more grateful to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Good morning, friends. It is a privilege for me to be with you today, especially to share the uh, podium here with my son, Andrew. Of course, his mom and I are very proud of him for so many reasons, but especially the opportunity that he has had to serve here in this fellowship of faith and ministry and light and hope. So thank you for having him as a part of your lives as he has meant so much to us in our lives. His, uh, I, I did want to say from a fatherly point of view, if you would like to see some baby pictures of Andrew <laughs> or different things, stories about when he has grown up, he has sworn me to secrecy though, however, so that his colleagues on the staff will not have some ammunition to use for him at upcoming staff meetings. But uh, So it is good to be here with you, especially as I think about how much this place has meant to the people of Greenville, South Carolina, to all the people of Greenville for, for so many years. The reading of God's Word today is from the 22nd chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. It's an interesting parable that Jesus told, a story with a twist, and a story that shows up in a couple of contexts, but if you will, hear now the reading of the parable of the wedding banquet as it's uh, phrased in the New Revised Standard Version. Once more, Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding banquet, but they would not come. Again, he sent other slaves, saying, Tell those who have been invited, Look, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they made light of it and went away, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his slaves, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his troops, destroyed those murderers, and burned their city. Then he said to his slaves, The wedding is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go, therefore, into the main streets and invite everyone you find to the wedding banquet. Those slaves went out into the streets and gathered all whom they found, both good and bad, so the wedding hall was filled with with guests. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. 
So as I mentioned, it's truly an honor for me to be with you today. Jennifer was kind to extend an invitation as she has uh, the opportunity to spend some time with family and friends this weekend. And as we are gathered here, we give God thanks as our theme of gratitude continues. We give God thanks for the beauty outside of the natural world, but also the warmth of this fellowship. And so the honor for me to be here with you extends to those who have graced this pulpit over these last few years. Jennifer, your new pastor, and Deb, your former pastor, it has been a privilege for me to work with them side by side, laborers in the vineyard here in Greenville for the past, oh, 15, almost 20 years now. They have been strong leaders, as you know. You are blessed to have them here, providing the kinds of programs that make a difference in this community, but also giving a voice, a voice that you hear in this place, but a voice that rings out through the neighborhoods and up and down the streets and into the places of seats of power in this community, a voice for those who otherwise have their voices drowned out. So it's a privilege to be here to stand where they have stood to recognize the power of the gospel and to see that in your lives and in your work as a congregation here at Triune Mercy Center. I know and our community knows and we count on you to be the cutting edge. The people who in our community are paying the closest attention to those whose needs are the greatest. And so for, for many years, we have looked to Triune, as everyone does, as a beacon, a light, a place of hope, so that we know in this community, because you lead us, that, that everyone matters, that everyone counts. And sometimes that means speaking truth to power, and you have done so. Sometimes that means wrapping, even virtually, our arms around one another, and moving forward in life because people are counting on us and we share the fact that we are in the transformation business. Not only in the transformation spiritually through the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ, but also economically and socially and emotionally and physically in this place that we like to call home and a place that we want everyone to have a place of their own. To call home. It's especially an honor though for me to be with you because I value so deeply the partnership that we have shared at United Ministries from which I retired just a few scant months ago, our partnership with you folks here, the congregation, but your team, those people who are out there day in, day out, encountering people whose needs are great, sometimes seemingly overwhelming, and yet keeping the faith, making sure that basic needs are met even while there is a voice of advocacy on behalf of those in our community who are neighbors for us in every sense of the word. That is the social work team that Andrew is privileged to, to serve on with Robin, but also everybody else on this team you are making a difference in this place, and that is appreciated. You know that the theme for this month is the theme of gratitude, but specifically the enemies of gratitude, those elements in our lives that become pinch points, if you will, places and experiences that can literally suck the vitality out of our lives. And so Tandy, a couple of weeks ago, mention nostalgia for the good old days and how that can distract us from appreciating what we have today and what the future holds for tomorrow. Last week, the struggle was with worry and the gospel message is clear, count on God to sustain us and sufficient unto the day is the trouble thereof, as Jesus said himself in the Sermon on the Mount. And yet, worry can sometimes overwhelm us especially in these days of social distancing, when so much is at stake in every decision, literally life and death. In the upcoming weeks, you're going to talk about 
the power of greed in our lives and its impact on gratitude as we know it and as we share it. And then finally, on All Saints Day, disappointment and grief and what those mean for us as we walk through those experiences. But today's enemy of gratitude is called entitlement. And it seems to me that it points us to twin imposters. And that is that we are either too good to share in God's hospitality or that somehow we're not good enough. Instead of an exposition of this passage, though, for today, what I thought I would do is, hearkening back over the years of working here with people in this community, I thought I'd share with you a story. It's a story that has touched my life so many ways over all the years. It's a story of resilience despite of adversity. It's a story of faithfulness despite despair. It's a story of perseverance even when the odds were stacked against you and so much was at stake. It is a story of one of the finest expressions of pure gratitude that I have ever known about and it all came about because there was something in her voice. I want you to hearken back with me to 2005. In many ways, that echoes what we're experiencing in 2020 today. A tough time, and Greenville was just at the cusp of realizing how fast it was going to be growing up. You'll remember our explosion of population and gentrification in this community and how we began to really see homelessness among individuals and the families, the people with whom we worked at Greenville Area Interfaith Hospitality Network, where I was director, we could see the surge that had taken place in the lives of so many, especially one family. She long ago gave me permission to use her real name and that of her granddaughter. Some of you may have known Ella Terry and little Cassie. As they walked the streets of Greenville, as they sought to find their way together, hand in hand, into the future, despite everything that was swirling around them, and one of those things became the rent simply became too much for her to stay where she was. She and Cassie were some of the first people to experience this power of being pushed out. First to the margins and then clearly out of town. And so she did what a lot of folks would do. She decided to bunk in with family, except in this case, Ella took off to spend time with her daughter in Florida. And we see a lot of families who do that, who double up, who stay where they can. Sadly, she got to Florida about the same time that Hurricane Wilma did. And if you think about that, well, the impact of that huge storm on southern and central Florida where she was staying, it wasn't long that because the power was out and the water was off, they simply could not stay there. So they decided what you might think, they came back to Greenville, but they couldn't go home where they had been before. So where did they go? Where do way too many families with children go when housing is no longer affordable and available for them? They stayed out at one of the motels out on the interstate. You know where we're talking about. And it turns out that people were knocking on her door in the middle of the night and so much happening there. It just wasn't a good place for a grandmother in her 70s and a granddaughter just barely six. And so that's where they were when she called me. It turns out that she had been subsisting on her meager social security income of about $780 per month. But like in a lot of cases, the money ran out way before the month did. And so the phone call came. She and Cassie were living in a situation where literally millions of children live in our country and hundreds of children live in our city and county. 
kids growing up in motels. But they couldn't sustain it. There wasn't even enough money to be able to stay there. And so the call came. And I knew that as two females in this family, in a small family, maybe, just maybe, there would be space for them at our wonderful partners with Miracle Hill over at Shepherd's Gate. So that was a possibility, but there was something in her voice. There was something that resonated with that particular time in my life and in what we were going through as a community and what she was experiencing as a family. And so we were able to say yes. Come in and experience God's hospitality as meted out through people of faith in congregations. I think many of you know that the Interfaith Hospitality Network, formerly known as GAIN, does this crazy innovative thing where families with children, families who are temporarily without a place to stay, they can stay together and move forward by residing in congregations. Churches, mosques, temples open their doors to their facilities and their hearts, and families walk right in. And they dwell together experiencing God's shared hospitality amongst themselves. And so that's exactly what Ella and Cassie experienced as they walk this, this pathway, this journey, uh, going from congregation to congregation, but keeping body and soul together. Now you might expect that a person in their 70s had had time to develop an opinion or two on a couple of items. Is that right? And sure enough, Ella had. She told us pretty much everything she saw, she thought about everything that was happening. Most of it was good, some of it didn't suit her, but we kept going together. And of course, her primary concern was for Cassie's well-being, her education, and her health. But you know, one of the things that troubled Ella the most, it was how, when she was going to move from congregation to congregation to congregation on a weekly basis, how was she going to do her tithe? She, want, she asked me more than once, she said, gosh, I'm, I'm in different places every week, and I want to do what's right with my tithe of my Social Security. Which church should I give it to? And I said, Ella, I think God's going to work with you on this. Why don't you hang on to that for a couple of months until you get settled into your own place, and I think it'll work out fine. She didn't like that answer. <laughs> but I think that's what she did. And so we continued on. Now you may or may not remember, if you lived here then, where you were the night the lights went out in Greenville, December 15, 2005, the ice storm of the ages. Were you here? If you lived in Greenville, raise your hand. If you had power that night and for the next week, you are a fortunate human being. As it went out, our families were residing out at Springwell Church, and they were receiving such excellent care, but no power. And so we were able to meander around here and there in some private homes. <laughs> Even stayed in my daughter's dorm room out at Furman for one night, but don't tell President Davis. <laughs> and then finally, there was enough power for the people at the UU Fellowship to take us back in as a group, and we slept on cots in the foyer experiencing, despite all the swirl of activity, God's special hospitality in that place. And you know, Ella came to me not long after everything settled down, and she said, life is funny, isn't it? So I went to Florida, hurricane came, power went off, and I got roasted. Came back to Greenville, ice storm came, power went off, and now I'm freezing. I said, we're going to make it, Ella. Stick with it. Make it, she did. It wasn't long after that that she was able to move, thanks to the generosity of our friends at St. Michael Lutheran Church, into a small apartment that they have in the basement of a house that they own. And Cassie continued to go to school at Blythe, just down the road. And if you know anything about how that works, if you ever had a child there in 2005 and you thought you were going to be the first one in line to pick up your kid, 
You were not, because Ella was. She was there every day, probably by 12.30. What can I say? So she moved there, and she stayed there for a little while, continuing to save her money and being a faithful person, and looking after dear little Cassie, and until she had the opportunity to move to an apartment over on Bird Boulevard. We all know where these places are. They're right here in Greenville. Someone who's from here, who had a particular need, who experienced God's hospitality from people of faith in this community and institutions that were willing to open themselves to what God would be doing. And so she moved into that apartment. And it turns out that in 2005, home, I remember it well, homeless families with children, there was a list, you know, uh, for people who are homeless to be able to get a subsidy, get Section 8 as it used to be called, affordable housing choice voucher. This list is lengthy, thousands of people's names on that list. But in those days, if you were a homeless family with children and someone would validate that, you could move to the top of the list. But somehow over the years, that went away. And families have struggled. And they have learned, sadly, to call a one-room motel room home. And that's where children are growing up. It's interesting that recently, some of those subsidies have come back. It's just too bad that it took a pandemic to make that happen. Our government, local, state, national, is investing in opportunities for people, once again, to have a place to call their own. And we know in Greenville, because of those same forces that impacted Ella and Cassie on those dark days <laughs> in the fall of 2005, we know there's still way too many people in our county who do not have a place of their own to call home. They remain homeless, especially families with children who are the fastest growing part of the homeless population. I don't need to tell you as a people of faith about the obstacles that confront those who are on this first mile search for home, haven, and hope in this community. Read the newsletter and the article that Andrew penned just recently. And he'll tell you again and reiterate and remind us all of the power of lack of affordable housing, lack of access to public transportation. What about decent medical care, especially mental health care for all of God's children? Those obstacles are real and they persist. There was a little spark of good news this week. I hope you saw it in the newspaper. And that is the Greenville Housing Fund has come together and is building a coalition of institutions and agencies and people to provide for more affordable housing in Greenville. 13,000 units, but over 10 years. We know that that barely scratches the surface of meeting the need. There is so much more to do. We are grateful for what is going to happen in this community, and I expect that Triune Mercy Center will be in the lead on that coalition, as you've been on the lead in so many other parts of making a difference in this community. And yet, the demand far outstrips the resources that we have. Getting resources to people who need it the most is one of our most compelling social and gospel callings in this day and in this time. Back to the story. So Ella's all settled in, and I got to work one Monday morning, and uh, it was a little unusual experience. I had a couple of emails that popped into my box right off, they were from some of our host congregations, and it, excuse me, then the phone rang, and it was Roma, the church secretary from over at Lee Road United Methodist Church. And she said, you know, the funniest thing happened when we got to church this morning. That happens a lot, doesn't it? The funniest thing, though, when we, when we got there, we put our key in, we found an envelope tucked into the door. And in the envelope, there was a note, 
and $13. And the note said, Cassie and I just want to thank you for taking care of us when we were homeless. And what Ella Terry had done is she had received her Social Security check and she tied it. And then she divided that tithe by the number of congregations that shared God's hospitality with them. And she went back and she said thank you. I don't know about you, but a note with $13, that's real gratitude for you. Thanks be to God. Again, friends, thank you for your presence today, for your presence, uh, redeeming presence in this community, day in, day out, 24-7, 365. Never forget that your faithfulness makes a difference. Your faithfulness and support of this congregation and its work and in the larger work of this community. So as you go, I pray that you will remember that God's grace is sufficient for you in all of your needs that God's peace which passes all of our understanding will be with us, but most of all, God's love will sustain us and see us through, both today and forevermore. Amen. A quick word of instruction. I'm sorry I don't do this quite as well as Jennifer does. I'm still learning the, the, all the logistics of this, but as I understand, the ushers will come forward and escort you out by row. Is that your custom? Yeah. All right. Uh, clearly, you're not Baptist because apparently you're going to follow instructions. <laughs> so, uh, thank you and God bless.